All right. Well, welcome. I'm Christina Henderson, Executive Director of the Montana High Tech Business Alliance. Welcome to our webinar, Rethinking Employee Benefits, New Solutions for a Changing Economy with Zach Schmidt. This event is part of a series the Alliance is hosting with resources to support our members. You can find details of these sessions at mthitech.org slash events. Zach Schmidt is a financial advisor at Waypoint Wealth Management in Bozeman. He's worked with many Montana tech leaders and business owners. And after Zach's presentation, we'll also open the floor for Q&A with the audience. So during the session, if you have questions or comments, you can either type it in the chat or turn on your microphone if you'd like to speak. And today's presentation will be recorded and shared with everyone who registered. Uh, so you'll be able to watch review this afterwards and also share it with your colleagues. Um, I'd now like to turn the floor over to Zach to get us started. All right, well, thank you. I was talking to Christina recently and she, or just before this and she said that not a lot of questions come in. So we're gonna change that hopefully today and uh, you guys can chime in with any questions on the chat function or just we can make a conversational. There's not a lot of us on this call today, but uh, hopefully we'll answer any questions that you may have. And if you guys have any experiences that you wanted to talk about or um, sit well with each other, I'd love to do that as well. So uh, I'll get into my slide deck here, but stop me with any questions or thoughts or comments. Okay, so the purpose of today's meeting was to talk a little about how uh, the employee benefits work in our changing world and what we're seeing from uh, not only from an advisor standpoint, but from a consumer standpoint and how it would work well uh, moving forward. And boy, this is changing quickly, isn't it? Uh, the world we live in is much different than it was six months ago, and I don't need to preach about that. Um, in Bozeman, they just announced that school's not going back until November if you're uh, younger and January for a little bit older kids. So um, I know we're all dealing with that. However, as it comes to employer-employee relationships, one of the things we wanted to just really talk about is how we're gonna compete, especially in this increased global market space. Um, what types of benefits our business owner clients are finding valuable and their employees are finding valuable as well. So here's a little bit about what we'll be chatting about today. Um, first, a little bit about how culture is a in a changing environment is and how we're rethinking that as employers. What are we doing to retain employees we can't afford to lose? How are the employers we're working with designing um, and encouraging benefits that create upward mobility for their, uh, their employees? What are we doing around healthcare and how are we navigating those trends and those cost centers? And what type of benefits strategically are we looking at and thinking about the long-term health of our business and our organization. Sounds about right? Okay. Well, uh, yesterday, Tim Cook was at a, um, a conference, The Atlantic, yes, and uh, he talked about how a lot of Apple's employees, about 85 to 90% of these employees are still working from home. And he said that, I don't believe that we'll return uh, to the way we were because we've found that there's, there are some things that are working really well virtually. And in that presentation, he talked about how a lot of his employees will be able to stay home and work remotely. As a small tech firm or mid-size or even a large tech firm in Montana, we have to consider these pressures and how it might affect us, not only from the standpoint of, of global competition, but uh, competition in Silicon Valley and things of that nature. Now, something we're seeing here happen is change is happening quicker and quicker and quicker for the employees and the employers we work with. And I think things, of, the winds of change and the outside pressures will see influencing um, our decision making will continue to change. Um, we're seeing a lot of firms rethink everything that they do around benefits, for example, in some mid to large size tech firms we work with or manufacturing firms, there used to be really good gourmet coffee. Well, it's hard to, to get that when you're working from home. But most employers have a budget for these expenses. 
um, certainly the ones that we work with um, who, who do this well, whether it be, you know, half day Fridays or, or free lunch, these things are all scheduled and, and expenses that we've thought about and have budgeted for. Um, things that are changing and taking places um, might be things that an employer starts thinking about, but very rarely do we see that there's a collaborative process. A lot of the, the executives we work with or employees who work for some of these tech firms or businesses around the state mentioned to us, boy, this, this process and how our benefits are changing as of late doesn't feel like a collaborative process. So one thing we wanted to stress today is to make sure that we're, we're, we're changing that paradigm. Um, a lot of the employers that we're working with who are having success are talking a lot about how they have focus groups or small, um, similar to maybe a diversity and inclusion group that uh, we, we spoke about pre-call, um, you know, just to make sure that employees are feeling heard about what's important to them and what's not. That's gonna trickle down to the retirement benefits and profit sharing for the firms who are certainly operating uh, in the positive this year. And we'll talk a little bit more about some profit sharing plans here in a little bit. Some other things that we wanted to talk about too is, is block scheduling. A lot of the employers that we're working with, we're having some success, are um, really dealing with this. Well, my last name starts with an S. My kids are gonna be at home Monday through Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they're in school. And I might have more time. Um, you know, a lot of folks in, in the communities we work in, um, full spouses work, it's very common anymore. So how are we switching and working with our employers um, to encourage them to rethink how the normal workday looks? Certainly, you can work anywhere. Um, and if you can work anywhere, can you work at any time? And how do you have teams who work at different times so that there is some camaraderie and communication? Um, that's a challenge, certainly. But I think it's an, an area of opportunity for a lot of the firms we work with. This last point, child care is along those lines. This is actually one of the questions I think that you had, Christina, is that what are we seeing around child care? A few uh, years ago, um, my wife who works at the hospital, they went to the, the board and said, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had a uh, healthcare or, or child care facility on campus? Wouldn't that, that make a lot of sense? And they did some studies around um, if that would work. But how do we make sure that in this environment where we might be homeschooling kids and, and finding uh, people or tutors to homeschool or, or children or just relearning how to do algebra, um, we can focus on a way to have childcare that makes sense for all of us. Um, so some employers that we're seeing who are doing this well, um, what they are doing is they are having on small groups, encouraging employees to connect if they have similar age children. Um, certainly, if they're, they're comfortable with that. Um, we're also seeing uh, other small groups work for child care, for daycare, drop off in times, along with that point before of block scheduling, if that makes sense. Um, so, then we talked a little, wanted to talk a little bit about how to encourage and design programs to encourage upward financial mobility for the people we work with. Um, these are all the classic options for different sorts of retirement plans, insurance plans, profit sharing plans that are available um, for most of us, that most of us know of. I guess the, the few that would I'd wanna touch on based on the current environment and what we're seeing, the winds of change is, is the student loan repayment paid family leave and wellness and professional development. Um, the employers that we're working with that are, are really having success in this space um, are, are encouraging people to um, take care of themselves. Uh, a statistic coming out of the Gallatin Valley that I heard recently was, um, and I'm sure I'll butcher this and it's recorded, so somebody's gonna fact check me. <laughs> but uh, Haven, for example, which is a local, um, domestic abuse shelter had a thousand percent increase in need um, over the last uh, or the first nine months of the year. 
So that's a scary statistic. But um, what type of wellness benefits are we working with with our employees and our um, employers? Are there places for them to have, uh, you know, counseling or flex plans on their health insurance to make sure that we're all taking care of ourselves? Um, professional development is another one. Um, we're seeing organizations understand that there's pressures from outside of Montana and the Gallatin Valley, certainly. And the employers that we're seeing that are having success in this space are finding ways to use some of the dollars that they've already accounted for, for coffee or um, free lunch or uh, you know snacks used to instead using a large portion of that budget to continue to encourage their employees to earn a designation or to go back to school or they're using those dollars that were already budgeted for student loan repayment programs. Um, if they go out and are able to um, you know, earn a degree or credential. Paid family leave, uh, I think, is a big one. Um, and, you know, obviously this is a hot button issue for a lot of folks. And I think a lot of organizations, especially in larger tech, have been leaders in this space. But small and mid-sized tech firms, certainly in small and mid-sized businesses, this is a big barrier of entry. Is how do you have a paid family leave program? How do you justify, um, you know, making sure that your employee, if they need to stay home because an employee is sick or a family member is sick, they can they can work from home and have money still coming in, so they're financially solvent. The number one why pe reason why people fail financially is because of medical debt. Um, and so it's really important, I think, for us to be good stewards for our employees to think about how are we making sure they have space to be healthy. Um, I don't see any questions coming in on chat yet, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to jump in. Um, we're rolling along here. Um, a couple pieces on here that I wanted to talk about that I, th I think that are underutilized that uh, I think are good benefits that a lot of competition um, of yours may not have is a lot of old 401k plans don't have a Roth option on them. That's a big benefit if you can defer more money income tax free, especially for your mid to higher level income earner um, employees, that's, that's a big benefit. Um, short and long term disability, being that a lot of employees that we work with, um, employers we work with are concerned about COVID, getting sick, um, one of the questions they'll have for us is, what does my disability insurance cover if I'm out of the office because I'm sick with something like COVID-19? Most plans do cover this, and it's a pretty, pretty cheap option, and it is very affordable. Um, another nice thing about short-term disability insurance on most plans is it covers maternity leave. Um, so that's a big benefit I think that people don't utilize. Um, we're seeing more and more Retirement or uh, employee benefits plans include 529 college saving plan contribution options. Uh, after your retirement account and saving a little bit for a rainy day, most folks want to take care of or help their kids with education, especially with the rapid rate at which those costs are increasing. However, very rarely do we have a plan in place in time for that. Um, it's a pretty easy cost effective way to set up a deferral plan for your employees is to say, okay, hey, let's bring in a financial planning firm to help set up a, a salary deferral program for $529. Your employees usually receive a tax break for funding it. Um, we don't see a lot of matching programs in this space, but it seems to make a lot of sense. Um, voluntary benefits, we're seeing more and more. Um, right now just because of I think a lot of people are nervous about costs that we work with and what's the future hold. Um, so there's a pullback on some benefits with some firms. And voluntary benefits would be your AFLAC, your um, colonial type of insurance, cancer policies, things of that nature. And a, a good way to dip your toe in the water around employee benefits if you're thinking, boy, what do we want to start with is there's these things out there called multi-life discounts where you can go out and sign up for a um, disability insurance policy, for example, for your group and not pay, um, but by setting up a group plan, 
um, and allowing employees to opt in, they would receive reduced prices up to some as much as 25% on a disability insurance policy or life insurance policy or something of that nature. Um, so I gotta move my, my zoom here so I can see the top of my screen. Uh, so some creative ways that I wanted to touch on to have retirement planning make sense for our employees. Um, the one I wanna jump to first is this fourth one, um, mega Roth IRAs. So a few years ago, Google actually decided, boy, for our highly compensated uh, employees were really finding it, it tough to make this job desirable. They're working a ton of hours, we're paying them well, but how do we encourage them to stay and see the benefits of, of working for us? So they've really spent a lot of time designing retirement plans and they've been a leader in this space. Um, one of the things they, they did and were, help, were able to help uh, keep in place and, and get in place is that there's this mega Roth IRA it's referred to in the industry. And that's a Google term, it's not mine. But how it works is for um, folks who certainly have the ability to, in a 401k plan, you can save $57,000 a year in, in 2020. And that's a that's a big chunk of change. But um, the problem is, is if it all goes into dollars that are taxable when we take them out, such as your normal 401k plan, it really doesn't put us in a better tax position in the future. We really just kick the can down the road quite a ways. So for Google's employees in this situation, they said, hey, well, what if we have a 401k plan with a Roth option? That'd be really great. So I'm gonna do a little math here. Um, so if you're under 50, you can defer $57,000 into a 401k plan, all in between match well, 19.5, you could put in our 19,500, you could defer as a Roth, including match. And say your match is, you make $100,000 and your, your match is 3%. Well, that means you could defer $22,500 into the plan. And anything remaining, you could contribute in a non-deductible after-tax portion that after-tax portion can immediately be deferred into a Roth IRA, which means almost all of your 57,000, or in this scenario, $54,000 a year could go into a Roth IRA. For the highly executive, highly compensated and executives that we work with, um, this is a really big deal. Um, it helps them get into lower tax bracket later. Most of those folks are okay with paying some tax now, um, as long as it means if and when taxes go up in the future, they have more money in their pocket. So that's a solution I think that more and more uh, folks will work with, um, will, will ask about and think about. And certainly when I have an, a client who moves from Silicon Valley or you know, working with Amazon or something of the sort, they say, hey, can I, does my firm have this? So this is something I think we'll hear more and more about. Um, another creative retirement plan uh, is this executive bonus plan. Um, so this is for an employer who wants to get around some ERISA requirements. Um, it's tough to give all of your employees a raise. I understand that. And for the folks who want to skew the compensation to maybe a, a manager or an executive or to some sales leaders. Executive bonus plans can really work well and we're seeing these more and more and more, um, especially if there's a few dollars to go around um, in terms of benefits and, and they wanna make sure it goes to the right folks. So an executive bonus plan is, is something akin to what a few years back was set up for President Cruzado at Montana State. And how that works is based on performance, she receives a bonus. Um, those bonus go into a plan and that plan has dollars that are received in the future income tax free. Similar but different to a golden handcuffs plan. Golden handcuffs plans are usually tied to performance. A bonus plan is, is just money that's set aside that grows in escrow 
till a future date. Another type of retirement plan that we see more and more uh, in the tech space, but certainly in the medical space, is a cash balance plan. A cash balance plan would be uh, a plan that were, is similar to a SEP IRA, um, SEP, SEP. And how those plans work is not only can you defer like a 401k plan, not only can you have some match and profit sharing or a match, but you can also have an additional profit sharing or pension piece. And that's based usually um, the most common formula is based on a percentage of someone's salary. So say someone is making $250,000 or $200,000, let's say for simple math, you want to defer an extra $25,000 or $50,000 into someone's plan. That 25% would be across the board consistent for your employees, so you could get them all an extra 25%. For executives and business owners, that usually allows you to skew anywhere between $200,000 and $250,000 into a retirement plan for, for those folks. Um, so on a good year and a very successful business, that seems to make a lot of sense. Now, it has to make sense from a bottom line standpoint, um, but if it makes sense, um, seems to work really well, and the executives we work with uh, seem to enjoy that. Um, so we'll spend a little bit of time here on healthcare. I know that there are a few questions that floated in before the presentation about, about this, and there have been some changes in healthcare and costs, and so I think the biggest thing we can do is just make sure we're well-educated and well-informed before we jump into things. Um, health insurance is a tricky wicket, and it's an expensive proposition, um, but I think it's going to be super valuable for us today and moving forward. Um, we're seeing more and more employers around the country, and certainly in Montana, who have self-insured plans. So a self-insured plan is different from your normal health insurance plan. Um, your normal health insurance plan, I like to describe as, as a cup and you put money in the cup or the jar every single month. And no matter what happens, if your group's super healthy, you get a 10% rate increase next year. And you say, thank you, um, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield, thank you Pacific Source, thank you whomever your insurance carrier is. Um, thanks for protecting us. We're glad to pay the premium. The difference on that in, in self-insurance or self-insured plan is that you take the money and it's kind of like having two coffee cups. Instead, you have one coffee cup over here and you have a water cup. Better for you anyway. Um, you can't see very many people's faces. You don't know if you get a joke, response or laugh. There we go. Um, this is like my ninth cup today, so. But it's folder, so it's not that strong. <laughs> um, so it's how self-insured health insurance plans work is you say, okay, I got two two vessels, and in the one, I'm just putting my premium from 50% over here and 50% over here. It's more complicated than this, but let's just keep it simple. And you can say, okay, well, at the premium, this is gonna what I'm gonna pay to the insurance company. And no matter what happens, that's their money. But this cup, the good cup, the water, if our group is healthier than expected, for the year, and your group is underwritten, so you can underwritten. There's some underwriting. You get so there's some uh, offer and acceptance here on a self-insured plan, but th that cup of water, or in most cases, say maybe 50%. There's different rules, um, but that money comes back to the organization if your group is healthier than expected. So, when you have a spouse, for example, who works at the hospital. And uh, they say, boy, I have to go in to do my health screen and they give me three benchmark goals to improve on. And if they do, they're gonna give me a $100 gift card to so-and-so. You think, boy, that's really nice of them. They're nice, but they're not that nice. The reason is, is they keep their cost low over here. There's more money that goes around um, for all of the, uh, it, more money that goes around the, the, and money comes back to the organization. So if you can keep your cost low over here, more money is going to come back to you as an employer. Now, why is this beneficial? 
Well, usually we're seeing lower rate increases. We're seeing organizations who are receiving real life money come back. You know, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars for some of the larger firms, some of the smaller firms, maybe it's, you know, a few thousand dollars. Those dollars can be used for premium payments. Those dollars can be used for, um, you know, reimbursed to the employees. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can do there, but it seems to be a really attractive option that we're seeing a lot in the market space. Um, there's a lot of different carriers out there, um, some good and some bad. Everyone has their pros and cons. However, um, you know, we're seeing that quite a bit. The other thing Matt, in healthcare. I have a quick question. Yep. <clears throat> At what employee headcount does self insuring? really tend to make sense yeah i mean so it really depends and i hate to say that but um boy we have employers that we work with who have 10 employees who are really healthy and uh you know they'll go out to blue cross blue shield and bid their plan and then they'll go to Cigna and bid their plan, for example, and, and, the, and the rates will be 20% less for self-insurance. Because if the plan can be underwritten um, and the insurance company knows a little bit better about what they're getting into, um, costs are usually lower. Now, because of that headcount, there's different organizations that may make requirements. So the larger the group, certainly, the less rules um, and the more frequently it'll, it'll work. Um, you know, I, I have an organization I was working with recently and they were going through the self-insured process and they had, I think, 22 employees. Well, it just takes one really unhealthy person in a smaller group. Um, and they had one of those people who was, you know, battling cancer and taking an expensive biological drug for another ailment um, that it, it didn't make sense and the standard health insurance, the Blue Cross Blue Shields of the world made more sense. Um, so it's gonna depend on group health in the past and what's predicted for the future, um, group size, a little bit on where you live, a little bit on things like occupation. Um, but if it used to be that you couldn't have a self-insured plan for less than 50 and then it was less than 20 and and then it was less than 10 um, but it really makes sense if you have a healthy group um, of young people certainly i say that's your sweet spot any other follow-up questions on that all right well cool uh because we're seeing folks who say like boy zach we used to have, uh, we used to buy lunch every Friday. I work with a, a tech firm who, who does that. And, and because of all their employees are working for, from home, they, they said, okay, how, how can we spend these dollars and how can we give back? And um, they ha have a health insurance plan that is able to uh, qualify for a health savings account. So kind of a fun option we're seeing now is this health savings uh, account matching programs pop up more and more. Um, and this seems to be something that you really write well in, in your um, employee manual, but you know, HSA dollars can, can sit and you can use those when you're 72 or 37. Um, and those dollars are great because uh, you receive a tax deduction for funding it. The employer is going to, receive a break for giving it to the employee and if you use them for health expenses any growth is income tax free so um you know in, in 2020 i believe you can set aside 45 50 um individually for an hsa and as uh, a family so if you have one dependent or married filing jointly um you have uh, 8100 dollars in 2020 those amounts go up every, you know, every year, every other year. And if you're able to set those dollars aside, um, it really makes a lot of sense. And employees really enjoy seeing their HSA balances in our experience. And so employers, it's a, it's a nice way to say, hey, here's something extra. Um, here's an extra 50 bucks a month, you know, 
$25. If you put in it for your first $100, we'll match it 25 cents on the dollar. Not a big cost, but seen as a big benefit, especially for people who have young families. Um, shoot, I know, you know, my son fell off his uh, bike this summer, broke his wrist. It's not a huge deal. We're not hitting our total uh, out of pocket individually or on the family side for health insurance, but we we did use all that HSA money or a good chunk of it. And um, it really, we felt good about having it. Um, I'm gonna skip this next flux and cafeteria plans. Um, but one of the, the really nice things is there were, you know, there, there was a time when HSA dollars couldn't be invested in the stock market. And you're able to do that. Uh, and it's something that I would encourage folks to take advantage with, not all of their HSA money, but some. Especially if you're young and you're healthy and you're trying to look for a tax reduction, HSA money, as we just talked about, is a big deal. So another piece we're seeing is employers sponsoring plans for HSAs that have the ability to be invested in the stock market. So as I just mentioned, an HSA, you can fund those dollars, they go into your HSA, you get a tax break for funding it. They're gonna grow income tax free and a distribution if they're used for healthcare, um, it's tax free also. There's not a lot of better places um, in the United States tax code to put money. Um, you know, if you're working overseas in a, in a war zone, you get tax free money all the way around if you save it and put it in a Roth IRA and take it out income tax free. So this is a big deal. You know, if you can set aside $100 and wake up at, at age, you know, 70, and you have, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars there to use for a procedure or a medical bill. That's that's a big win. So, um, you know, kind of a, um, a hot phrase you'll hear in the industry is the three X tax advantage or the three time tax advantage on, on investing HSA dollars. It's a really affordable option to set up if you're an employer as well, these HSA accounts for your employees. And you can have one plan that's managed by you or you can allow your employer to set up an HSA anywhere they choose. And you just direct the dollars there um, on their direct deposit. Now there's some rules and some things around these invested HSAs that you'll wanna be careful of. For example, minimum balance in invested HSA accounts. So if there's one big injury, one firm, for example, I know of in the industry won't allow you to have less than $250. Otherwise they start charging you fees. So there's some things you'll wanna be aware of. Um, to vet these plans for your employees, if this is something you're, you'd like to sponsor, but they're out there. Um, so, those are, so those are some good things that I encourage you to take a look at. Okay, so uh, something new for 2020, um, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is the SECURE Act and 401k plans. Um, so I'm not sure if you guys have talked about this at all, on any of your other webinars? No, no. Well, let's bore you at the end with some tax code. So <laughs> the SECURE Act was passed uh, and new for 2020. Um, is there some tax advantages for setting up and adding features to 401k plans? So if you don't have a 401k plan, you have about eight days to set one up for 2020. Uh, you know, if you want to defer money for this year. Um, if not, we can get you set up for next year. Uh, and how these 401k plan tax advantages work is the IRS, essentially it feels like they want us to do more and they want us to save more and they want employers to encourage their employees to save more. We don't need to be political, but um, it feels like we're being encouraged to help, which is a good thing. Um, but there's some pretty good tax incentives. So for organizations of uh, more than 20 employees, but uh, not all of those 20s are, there's a formula, are, are highly compensated, but less than 100 employees. The tax credit is $5,000 a year, and that's a dollar to dollar uh, reduction of income. So that's a, that's a great thing. Um, and that tax credit actually goes for three years for a new 401k plan. So if you say, hey, um, we're thinking about adding a plan for 2021, and and uh, or we want to add some money at the end of the year here for our employees. We're in a hot, uh, hot water on taxes because we have all that um, PPP money that we spent and 
were granted to us. Now we need to count as income. We need to spend some of this somehow. Um, a 401k plan would be a great way to do that. And in future years, you're going to receive a tax credit. Um, if you have an old 401k plan that uh, is already in existence, you're out of luck on the $5,000, but there are some tax credits um, for adding automatic enrollment um, to your plan. So for example, once someone becomes eligible at six months, uh, they just uh, join the plan and have an automatic uh, percentage saved unless they opt out. For example, that might be a 3% match. So if the employee kicks in three, the employer will kick in three. Is there a tax credit for that? There's also a tax credit for automatic escalations of income savings. So for example, one year you start off at 5%, the next year you go to six, the next year you go to seven to encourage your employees to save more. Um, so those are a couple of nice features around, um, you know, being good stewards of your firm is looking at these tax credits. There's definitely some strategic advantages to help look at the long-term health of your business. We don't want to just give it all away. I know that we're all, we all want to operate in the black, but this is a couple of good spots um, by adding these employee benefit plans. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of firms looking at how do we protect ourselves too, especially with health being so precious and all of us looking at that. So we're seeing a lot of employers look at disability overhead expense and key person disability insurance um, as they pivot to say, okay, well, what's next? We're, we we've remember now that we're not, we're, all, we're not all Superman. How do we protect ourselves? And we're also seeing a lot of firms around employee benefits to look at. And I didn't talk about in healthcare, we're seeing a lot more um, businesses operate as co-ops or um, it's employee owned businesses. You know, that's super helpful in some ways. It helps reduce some costs and help us get around, especially if you had a roofing company, maybe some workers' compensation. Um, or if you're in manufacturing, maybe some workers' compensation. Um, we're seeing a lot more of the people ask us questions about um, cross-purchase agreements and buy-sell agreements and how do we set up our business for employer stock options um, and, and, uh, and cap tables and things of that nature. So um, those are things I think that, that if you're doing some of these things now, might make sense kind of at the last piece of this puzzle to look at, okay, what's next? How do we continue to give back? How do we continue to grow our business? Um, but how do we protect ourselves in case, you know, if Christina and I were in business together and she became disabled or disenfranchised or um, passed away, she becomes deceased, how do we return those shares to the closely held organization. So those are some things I think that um, as we look at the long-term strategic health, the business we really want to focus on, not to overstate it, but um, our health is all precious. precious. Here are a few of the folks on our team. Um, myself, Carolyn, Megan, we have three others as well. If you guys ever reach out with questions, these are one of the three of us will get back to you within 24 hours of the commitment we want to make to you and the service we want to offer. Um, we are big sales partners, we are very uh, fee based and non fee based, depending on the setting financial planning firm, wealth management firm. We specialize working with business owners in tech and in the medical field um, based, in, based in Bozeman here. But I think we have clients in, you know. 40 states now, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. So uh, that's that's kind of my spiel. I wanted to open it up to questions and leave time for that to make sure that we answered anyone's questions and they felt heard. Yeah, so if anybody in the audience today has your own specific questions, you can either type in the chat or just turn on your mic and, and speak up. We'd love to hear from you. We've got about maybe five or six minutes left of our time. One question I have for you, Zach, we have a, a number of startups um, in our high tech community. Uh, what's been fun for me to see is uh, Ascend Vision Technologies in Bozeman started with the High Tech Business Alliance as a, um, a startup six years ago, and they just sold um, for 
you know, huge, like $350 million. Um, pocket, pocket change. Pocket change. And what was phenomenal is they were also employee owned. So every employee, all the 60 yeah. people in Bozeman who had shares in that company got a check from that sale. So, um, so it, the way like a startup actually can be an incredible um, place for uh, a new employee to join and share in that growth and um, uh, success. But a lot of startups, when they're first starting out, it's hard for them to provide competitive benefits with much bigger firms. And in Montana, we, we do have a lot of thriving tech firms that are able to provide very good benefits nationally. Now with remote work, um, you have a lot of big firms that are providing very good benefits. If you were a startup or you were advising a startup, where would you advise they invest first or the most of their um, benefits for new employees? So just so make sure I hear your question correctly, um, where, where would I put my money first? Yeah, how would you prioritize benefits if you were a startup and had limited resources? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the first thing I would do, not to sound like it's a cop-out question, but if you're small and in your startup organization, the first thing I would do is I want to get the people who are the drivers of this organization besides me in the room to ask that question. Um, no, I think too often uh, we're guilty as all, all of us of saying, hey, this is what I would do. Um, this is what I would like, and this helps me most on taxes. If the goal is for you to get to an employee-owned firm, um, that's going to be very different than if it is if you're a sole proprietor or you're a, a three-person organization who has some employees who are cogs in the wheel but not forever employees. Um, the, you know, it, it's tough. The number one as reason I mentioned earlier, people fail financially is because of medical debt. So when I'm sitting down with someone who is say 45 years old and they work for themselves and, and their health insurance bill for their family is a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a month, that's a huge barrier to entry. Um, that's a mortgage payment in a lot of the communities we work and live in. So I think usually what the, where the conversation goes, the first things first is how do we take care of our family from a health perspective? Um, so usually, usually it's health insurance um, is what the answer is. However, that might not all, always be true because if you have, for example, if you and I had a business together and, and we had Jennifer working with us, and it's the three of us, and you said, hey, we want to set up health insurance and I'm your main, your main person. And if you just, you just did that, I would opt out. My wife works for Bozeman Health. Um, they're, you know, there's, there's not a better plan for me um, and my young family. So I think I'd be missing it, right? So I'd start off first asking and pulling the employees and put, pulling together a focus group. And then second, usually what happens is it's health insurance. Word. Do you have any thoughts? Like we had a question in the chat um, from Mark. Can you speak to the options available to solo employees, such as a C corp? Yeah. Does your um, advice change? Yeah, I guess the the, the um, Secure Act does help for as far as employee benefits um, for a sole proprietor. Um, health insurance is also something that be you know, uh, a, a great thing because you can pay your premiums pre-tax. There's a section 125 uh, plan which allows you to set up pre-tax deferral of health insurance premiums, which would be great. Um, you know, the more money that you can hide away in retirement plans is going to help you on taxes. If you're a sole proprietor um, or a solo employee, um, that would be, those would be a couple of things I think would make a lot of sense. Um, you certainly wouldn't be as worried about a focus group for yourself, but uh, <laughs> you know those would be um, some things I think that would really make sense. Is the is how much if you're in a situation where you're you're wanting to defer income to make sure you have the right employer-sponsored plan, even though it's just you, um, and you're making sure that 
uh, you're doing the most tax efficient way possible. Now, certainly self-insured group health insurance is normally your best bet in that scenario. Mark says he'll cancel his focus group. <laughs> uh, maybe, you know, that, that cute one on your shoulders, uh, she might be the one you're asking. There What's you important to you? And then maybe, you know, kidding aside, maybe it's a way for you to find ways to help yourself on taxes and, and set up a, a, you know, 529 plan or um, making sure you're maxing out an HSA. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things you can still do and right size this. Um, if you're 10 employees or, or you know, 75 or, Five thousand. Well, that's phenomenal. Thank you so much, Zach. I've learned so much today. We've done sessions before on employee benefits, but some many of the tools that you've mentioned today, I think, are either new opportunities or things that I we had not yet heard about. So I think this will be very informative um, for folks who are on the call. Again, um, a reminder that we'll send the recording out to everybody who has participated in the slides so that you can go back and there will be a transcript uh, over the next few weeks so that you can go back and, and dig into some of this great information or share it with colleagues. Uh, thank you again, Zach, and thank you to our audience for joining us and have a great day.